In this course on biblical eschatology, let's start with some definitions. The obvious question is, what is eschatology? Now that's a big word, so let's break it down. The ology part of eschatology is from the Greek logos, meaning word. So anything ending in ology is a word about or an explanation of something. For example, biology is an explanation about living things. Theology is our very faltering attempt to say a true word about who God is. And anthropology is our account of what it means to be human. Now, eschaton is the Greek word for the end. The, the plural eschata means last things. So eschatology is our attempt to say something meaningful about the future and the destiny of human beings and the world. Now, here we need to distinguish between popular eschatology and biblical eschatology. There are two fundamental misconceptions in much popular eschatology. First, popular eschatology tends to be otherworldly. It imagines the destruction of the earth and are going to heaven to be with God. Popular eschatology also tends to be speculative. It treats the Bible like a crystal ball, telling us about weird things that are going to happen in the future. The Antichrist, the tribulation, and various geopolitical events that are supposed to fulfill biblical prophecy. By contrast, biblical eschatology is holistic, not otherworldly, and it is ethically oriented, not speculative. Now, biblical eschatology is holistic in two senses. First of all, biblical eschatology takes into account the entire canonical thrust of the Bible, the movement of all of Scripture towards a goal or a telos. Telos is another word for eschaton, the end, the goal. Eschatology is not a crazy speculative add-on to the Bible. Rather, the whole biblical story, from start to finish, from creation to eschaton, is about God's intentions for this world. These intentions are signaled at the beginning of the Bible, and they're partially realized throughout history, and then they are fully realized in the consummation of all things. So biblical eschatology is holistic in connecting the Bible's vision of the end with the entire biblical story. But biblical eschatology is holistic in another sense too, because it focuses not on God taking us out of the world to heaven, but rather on the redemption of creation. The Bible is clear that God desires to dwell in intimate fellowship with us on earth. And the biblical story is precisely about God coming to us, the Emmanuel theme, to redeem us and the earth itself and it's not about us going to be with God. New Testament scholar George Eldon Ladd put it well. The final redemption is not flight from this world to another world. It may be described as the descent of the other world, God's world, resulting in a transformation of this world. Or, as Ladd says in another place, salvation is not the gathering of the souls of the righteous in heaven, but the gathering of a redeemed people on a redeemed earth in perfected fellowship with God. So biblical eschatology is holistic. It is also ethically oriented. The point of biblical eschatology is not to give us information about the future. In fact, the strange variety of images and symbols that we find in the Bible about the promised future can be quite overwhelming and confusing. But once we ask the question, why does scripture give us these images? What's their point? The answer becomes clear. It's to encourage us to live today in accordance with this amazing vision of God's purposes. And the basic thrust of that vision is quite clear. The way I put it is that ethics is lived eschatology. The point is that the vision of the future that we truly embrace will inevitably affect how we live today. And here I'm drawing on an important statement by the Christian philosopher and ethicist Alistair McIntyre. McIntyre says, I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question, of what story or stories do I find myself a part? In other words, ethics is narratively shaped. Many Christians are confused about eschatology and about how to live today because they're confused about the Bible's big picture, this amazing narrative vision of God's purposes for creation. But if we want to be faithful disciples of our Lord in this complex and broken world, we need to ground ourselves in the biblical story 
from creation to eschaton. We need to learn that story. We need to indwell that story of God's promised future. In the late 19th century, the evangelist Dwight L. Moody articulated his vision of the future. In a famous 1877 sermon, Moody wrote, I look on this world as a wrecked vessel. God has given me a lifeboat and said to me, Moody, save all you can. In the same time period as Moody, the Christian statesman Abraham Kuyper articulated his quite different vision for the future of this world. Like Moody, he imagined a word from heaven coming to him. This is what Kuyper said in an 1880 speech. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign Lord of all, does not cry, mine. It makes a significant difference whether we understand this world as a wrecked vessel from which we should try and escape, or as God's creation, which for all his brokenness belongs to Christ, a world that he has never given up on but wants to redeem. In this course, we'll follow the logic of the biblical story as God's desire to redeem creation. And one specific lens that I'll use to focus the biblical story is God's desire to dwell with us on earth. Once we're attuned to look for this theme in the Bible, we'll begin to see that it unifies the entire Bible from creation in Genesis 1 to the eschaton in Revelation 21 and 22. So I invite you to join me in a journey through Scripture as we trace the theme of God's love for creation and His plan to redeem earthly life and live with us on earth for eternity. You ready? In the next session, we're going to look at the topic of the renewal of all things.